the the remix album Disco, and we realised that there were you could do various things in the mix that we didn't feel you could necessarily do on a a, a proper album. So Please consists of five songs in a very con in in a concentrated. So did I say five songs? Yeah, you mean do we so just five? Go? Those I'm talking about, please. Yeah. Five songs per side, yeah. where each song is in a concentrated form, where you just get the song. Mm-hmm. And we thought, well, you could actually be more, you know daring with the mix, you know, you could introduce 12 inch type ideas and things and uh, and we've done that a bit on this album, you know. With, a, with an album you don't really get much space to, to go as far as you might like to, you know. In fact at one stage we were thinking of putting out a double album where each one was a long mix. Mm-hmm. So you had, you know, like two or three tracks per side and it was very more experimental in that way. But we also like that concentrated pop song as well, you know. We've, we, you know, we normally write songs in that way, rather than just as a dance track or a groove. So um, it's kind of a bit of a mix, I think. Really, you know. It starts one more chance as a 12-inch mix. I mean, there is a 7-inch mix was done, but the 12-inch was more exciting, and it built up. It took us as a great start for the album. Mm-hmm. It really, building up the 12-inch mix was a moodier sort of mix as well, wasn't it? Also, yeah. it set an attitude for the yeah. film, which we liked, you know, this sort of very hard driving, Such less, you know. Thing. The big picture was the car, I remember there's a car squealing around, the brakes could squeal all through it. And uh, so we deliberately, uh, also we tried to make the, the sound slightly bigger and more outrageous, like when it's a sin, <laughs> which even the seven inch version is, although they played it on the radio, it's five minutes long, four minutes, 15 seconds long, and the radio is playing it right to the end. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and it, it's, 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 really, I think it's interesting all the way through, it doesn't get boring, I mean, there's lots of things keep happening. And uh, again, we try to do that with some of those songs to be you know, completely over the top. Because often um, people are restrained and say, you think, well, sure, do, you, sure. do you think you're overdoing this? And we uh, yeah. think, yeah. And uh, we, didn't, daring, uh, we didn't get hung up on the idea of being tasteful and restrained. And, um, you know, like a lot of groups do nowadays, mm. I think. We just did what we liked. I think, you know. Also, I think we're more confident now in having made an album before the same world. We produce various things ourselves and stuff. I think we sort of have a break clear. We have a clear idea of what we want to do with this round. In uh, One More Chance, you exited I Don't Mind. Was it uh, off chance? Was it ended in? It's total, total off chance. It's actually, um, it's just a mix. It sounded like that, you know, like mm-hmm. you were going away and said, oh, I don't mind or whatever. It just sounded good, I thought, isn't it? Because uh, actually it's from the middle bit of the song. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't mind, baby, I don't mind. Just give me one more. Back into it. But the way he did that, then it just faded. It, it was just fading all the cushion out so the music wasn't really playing. And then it just, uh, it was Julian Mendelssohn next to it. Mm-hmm. And then the voice came, I think, by accident, actually. I think it was to turn on the more voice you don't know. It just came saying, I don't mind. And it just sounded it's mm. really good. Um, uh, what Am I is uh, the new single, isn't it? Yes. A bit dusty. How did you come in? I mean, were you fans of her? Or was well, we'd written, we'd written a song with um, a person called Ali Willis. I know, too. Who's, um, yeah, who's... Uh, <laughs> Los Angeles and she was in London and we went into the studio and wrote the song and um, she sang you know the, the duet with Neil she's a songwriter um, she, 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 she's co-written um, Big Girls London and things like that and uh, the Neutron Dance I think was one of the biggest hits that was probably what is this today? which was done one in America I think and anyway so we wrote the song with her and she sang she sang you know the part which Dusty eventually sang and um, we were going to put this song on the first on Please, but... Um, oh, it's an old song. Well, it's really fairly old. No, no I mean... Two uh, years. From the previous album. That's what I mean, old in that yeah, song. Oh, yes. Yeah, no, it's, we, we wrote it, I think, in the end of 1995. Yeah. Maybe like, yeah, yeah. Anyway, we were thinking who, you know, who to do, who to, you know, to use as female vocalist. And someone in our office said, um, oh, why don't you, you know, use Dusty Springfield, always going on about how good she is. And we thought, you know, mm-hmm. can't get Dusty Springfield because, you know. But anyway, once you've um, had, you know, a bit of success, it's amazing that you can actually work with people that you would never have thought you could do. Anyway, so eventually she agreed to do it, and she she flew over and um, sang the part. She sang it great, actually, just like good old Dusty. You know. Yeah, but good old, a good good young good young. Dusty. <laughs> well, I thought you have to say she's uh, you know, pushing a bit actually. Um, well, uh, 
If I didn't know, actually, I, I would have uh, had the difficulty to recognise who it was. I mean, the way it is mixed. Well, actually, you know. Neil's and Dusty's range, vocal range, is kind of similar, isn't it? And um, the first mix we did of that, you could there was less distinction between. Them. I mean, this one the this is, is the second mix. I think when she has the bit, she sings by herself. Sings you when I'm happy. That bit. Uh, I think that's really, really sounds like Dusty's. It sounds so like. Mm. And, uh, but her voice has been EQ'd and, um, you know, and the reverb as it would have been in the 60s, so we've tried to keep her sounding as she did in the 60s on this one. Shopping is one of the first mixes where you really went to town, you know, you, you really were doing whatever you wanted. This was, to this was good fun to record, actually. Um, we got um, JJ in the Art of Noise, mm. who produced the first uh, track we did, and uh, he was... Uh, Fairlight programmer. He brought a Fairlight 2 in, not the new one, the old one, which is a very rock and roll sort of instrument. And we kind of just had a good time doing it. We just vibed up, as they say, in the studio. And we played lots of manually, didn't we? And we just, um, actually, we, we had a very sort of like... Good ring the balls it. <laughs> and so, rather than program everything in, a lot of it was just played by hand, really. Mm -hmm. And um, when you talk, actually, we always deride this human feel thing. We always sort of say, poo poo is a load of nonsense. But actually, you do get quite a good feel when everything's played by hand, because everything's just, you know, as you hear it. And um, that was real good fun, you know, trying to do. Your voice is tricky, though, isn't it? You don't sing it uh, straight into the mic, though. There is some. I, it's um, double trapped all the way through. There's also a vocoder. The, the vocoder the shot everything thing by yeah, hand. Yeah, yeah. The great vocode is actually the vocode. Is the vocode on? There's a vocode on Wake Up as well, and there's another track we've done this song. Well, we're, we're quite into vocoders at the moment. Mm -hmm. They're real. They're surprise. quite a funky sound, yeah. And not just the thing. We start going ah, 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 ah. It's just on the thing ah on the vocoder. It just sounded really good. Yeah. I like vocoders. Is that is this actually the running order? Have yes, you studied it is. one? This is yeah. Actually, I think that's an unusual track for a shop. I think it's quite a departure from anything that's on Please. Mm -hmm. I think it sounds quite um, it sounds quite black for us. Um, Pop the vocal. Pop the vocal. But mm -hmm. if, if somebody was if somebody black was singing, you know, some New Yorker was singing rap over it, it would sound I think probably quite convincing as a mm -hmm. you know a New York track. You know, because the rhythms are very a bit of a departure I think from the first time where they were more. This is kind of doodle. You know, it's more sort of more down. I think that's quite, you know, more funky really. The next one is Rent, which is uh, lyrically, I think, one of the more interesting ones. Mm. Because it's an uh, observation or, um, you know, I don't know how to term it, a story of um, New York, America. Oh, well, you, it is. Uh, it is in America. Yeah, it's sort of, um, I, as far as I understood, but don't forget, I listened to it only once, you know. <laughs> Could have misunderstood. It's about a toy boy or something. Yeah, well, or a toy boy or a toy girl, really. It's really yeah, yeah, yeah. about sex and power, mm -hmm. you know, someone who's living with, who's a kept woman or a kept man, mm -hmm. whatever, who's living with someone who's powerful, mm -hmm. and, uh, and who they, they actually love. And uh, But really, they're sort of wondering whether it was the best thing. Look at my hopes, look at my dreams. The currency we've spent, the currency we've spent could mean the mm. money that they've spent, sure. or that the dreams were the currency mm. that really have been spent, and that this one person has had power and success at the expense of the other. And then it's the kind of I, I love you, you know, you pay my rent. That's right. And uh, well, at least, you know, I've got someone to believe. And, uh, well, just maybe kind of bitter, I love you, you pay my rent. And, uh, and that's what it was about, really. And you often see that, I think, American politicians' wives. Maybe Pat Nixon or something mm. like that, you know. These people go through hell, I think, often. Um, but especially when they're not really public figures, and they don't want to be public figures. Yeah, you know, they're dragged they, into They give the everything up for their husband's craving for power and status. <laughs> and craving some, for power. <laughs> and sometimes, well, you know, they sacrifice a lot of these people. You know, I mean, Pat Nixon could give an alcoholic, didn't she? Ford's wife was an mm. alcoholic. And, uh, uh, very oh, the Betty Ford Clinic. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's why she started, of course. They have a very the unhappy time, a lot of these people. Mm. And, um, you know, so that was really the story of the, um, the story of the, uh, 
someone else, and maybe it's a call girl, just tall mm -hmm. boy, as you say, you know, someone phones them up, sure. they've had a recommendation at the start. You phone me in the evening on here, say, and brought me caviar, which I'm dressed up all over to tell me who you are. And um, so it is a slight story as well. But also, I think it's true of quite a lot of people's lives. There's only been maybe wives who know more than husbands in a marriage or something. But they have to sort of, um, in a middle class marriage, they have to entertain the boss to dinner and drive the children to school. And, and um, you know, they sort of send, dress up nicely, you know, to be. Um, you know, we've done a bit often said before that you know a lot of wives are supposed to be kind of a brilliant secretary and sort of a wonderful whore at the same time. And uh, I think a lot of people's marriages are like that. And, uh, you know, it's about women being treated as real trapped, I think, you know, to even middle class existences, whether it be in England or Dallas or anywhere. You know, it's any problem. Mm, of course. Um, hit music. There is a subtitle here. What have I? Ah, is that a mistake? Or, uh, uh, I thought it was a mistake. Or well, what, what is, it's just after hit music, it's a little reprise of Waterfall. But actually, we're going, we're we're going to take that off as on a cassette. Oh, oh, isn't it? Oh, isn't it? oh that's good. But we're going to cut it off anyway. No, no, I didn't hear it. I mean, like, I think maybe it's a long pause. It probably left it. If you probably whizzed the tape forward and turned over. No, I didn't. But, didn't you? No, it should have been on there. Yeah. Well, anyway, we're going to take it off anyway. To there was a little reprise, mm -hmm. the voice just kept saying, Go on, and actually, it's kind of been take off really on. But hit music, it, it's got the, um, you know, drums on it, hasn't it? Or am I mistaken? The real drums? No. It's a very real sound. It's a very real sound. Yeah, actually, it's we, we, on yeah. this album, um, a lot, quite a few tracks of Fairlight 3, the new Fairlight, mm. um, which we didn't use at all on, please. Mm. Um, in fact, I don't think it was even. I don't think it was even out then. The first three. The suburbia was the first track we've done with the first three, and some of these sounds are, you know, very realistic. Like some of those drum sounds are incredible, actually. Mm. I mean, I was fooled completely. I thought it was a live drummer, you know. Mm. You well, you'd be surprised. Actually, a lot of um, rock albums use Fairlight drum sounds because Andy Richards. Uh, should we say? Should you say? Anyway, Andy Richards was going off to Mutt Langer's studio to do put the drum sounds on. Was it Def Leppard? Someone or other. Anyway, some some really big rock group, and it was you know he was going along with the Fairlight Three to put his sample drum sounds on. No. <laughs> so I mean, a lot of people. I think people don't. You know, so it's not just it's not just groups like us that use sample. I mean, a lot of rock group, rock albums have sample. So I presume that strings that are supposed to be in couldn't couldn't happen here. Yes. I felt like no, we so felt like. Cut, cut. I mean, you'd really cut the corners. You know, save a lot. There's not. It's not cutting the corners. It costs more. Of course, I'm only kidding. Actually, that wasn't going to be the case on that. Um, we had a whole arrangement for orchestra. Um, scored by um, Angelo Badlamenti, who'd done the music for the film Blue Velvet, mm -hmm. and um, this, you know the score came over with our manuscripts and everything. And um, but we hadn't got the orchestra in time. Mm. We were actually planning to do it with an orchestra, sure. and um, we needed to have the album finished by Sunday. Sunday was gone, and uh, we couldn't get an orchestra until the following Tuesday, and so. Rather than just put the album back, we uh, thought, well, we'll get a Fairlight in. And so the whole score was programmed into the Fairlight, each part. So you've got the violins, the bass, the, you know, the woodwind, the brass, everything is programmed in on a separate channel. And um, this sounds like an easy way out, but it actually takes longer to do. If you have an orchestra, they, the orchestra comes sure. in and in two hours, they just play it straight away. This took days, and it actually, a Fairlight programmer costs about a thousand, you know, anyway, a lot of money. Yes, lot of money. And it's difficult because each instrument takes longer to hit the note, has a different attack time. Mm -hmm. So you've got to reposition all the, all the sounds so that they're in time with each other. And so there's a lot, the process is a lot harder and um, more time consuming. But it's interesting because it sounds kind of like an orchestra, but it also sounds like a fair light. I think, and I, I like that. Mm -hmm. you know. it's good. Um, well, we skip over it's a sin. Uh, my father, I don't want to drive Jonathan King in. Mm -hmm. Who is it? I don't know, I mean, 
Am I there for something? Yeah. <laughs> no similarity. I mean, I don't know what the guy is well, talking neither, about. Neither do we. Neither does Cat Stevens. I mean, I really, I mean, I know the track. I mean, old enough to remember. <laughs> when I heard it the first time, I mean, mention. I said, what? So, am I crazy? He's sitting as a DJ and try to sing um, Wild World over it to sing on the radio. He couldn't do it. He gave up and said, well, oh, forget it then. It's, not, the same, it's not exactly the same chords. It's not even the same chords. No. I know, uh, so... Anyway. Anyway, forget it. I mean, I uh, just, you know, I, mean, I, I was shocked personally. Man. Anyway, um, in Wake Up, you name check two songs. Tainted Love and Love is Strange. Or yeah. am I right? Who is Love is Strange, but... It's up. Take note, it's not Love is Strange. Who is it? It was the Emily Brothers and also Buddy Holly. Was it? Oh, uh, I probably will know it actually. It sounds familiar. Uh, uh, oh, I know it. Love is strange. Yeah. Well, so Didn't somebody modern do that? Is a modern do that? Anyway, I know the song. Are they your favourite songs or is there any I like that song actually. It's got a great line. Where are you from? Where are you from? Where are you lost it? No. <laughs> I'd like it. I mean, it seemed to fit the idea of the song. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes, you know, if you were to be in love or something like that, or I mean, it's about love and Christ, love, lots of that. And um, you hear a song on the radio, which is normally never really meant to just like a pop song. Sure. And suddenly the lyrics would suddenly think, oh, I don't know just what you mean. It sounds as if they sound mm. very, very specific to what you're going through. And, um, and that's why I chose these two Tainted Love and Love is Strange. Um, which are both songs really about the flood going wrong. Mm. Um, you know, so they, they seem to fit the idea of the song. Um, also, I quite like the line actually. Um, I quite like mentioning other songs in a song, so it's quite kind of like Do you think that they serve any purpose that people go out and check them? You know, do you well, if they did, it would fit the, um, it would certainly fit the mood of the song. Mm. Both the songs would. You know, we're just there. They're both moody love songs, not about love necessarily being a wonderful thing, about what I'm going to go for. Um, and uh, so, it just, so they seem to fit um, the feel of the thing. Also, I like the fact that it was a very um, prosaic setting. I stood at the kitchen sink, my radio played songs like Tainted Love and Love is Strange. Um, I don't know if many people mentioned kitchen sinks in their books. <laughs> no, I don't think so. But uh, now that you mention it, uh, there is one thing that goes through your songs. Is uh, uh, you know, on the first album was more evident that that was melancholy. It was plenty of this one. This album hasn't got it that much. Although there are bits and pieces, you know, sifting through and so on. But there is, I think, one more chance is. Uh, very typical of your writing, in a sense that it's a vision of a lonely man on a you know deserted street or whatever. Am I on the right track? Yes, I think so. I mean, it obviously it must say something about me, I suppose. But mm. um, a lot of this, of course, is a romanticised idea as well. Sure, sure, sure. I mean, okay. the idea of the lonely man in the big city street. I was imagining one more chance in New York for some reason. <laughs> and um, in fact, for some reason, I was specifically imagine. But I'm walking down Central Park South when I in front of Central Park where, they, where those horses are. Uh, I always specifically imagine that when I hear one more chance, I always have that in my mind. And it's very cold and raining. And because uh, I just live on I work for Star Hits in America when you, we used to walk home. I live in Central Park West. And uh, you get those bitter winds blowing around the corners in New York, blowing over from the river. And when you turn around that corner past the Plaza Hotel, you get this wind blowing down to the Park so it's just like in December, and you and you wish you got a taxi or a bus or something. Um, anyway, sorry, so, you know, mm. I think there is the idea of, um, that there is, that's because I like walking around the streets, um, you know, by myself, as well as still do. Um, you know, there's a sort of romanticism there, I suppose, as well. Oh, well, yeah, you're allowed to. Sorry? Are you allowed to, I mean, by the fence? I mean, do they pester you, you know, see you in the streets? Or? People don't really. Uh, last night I went out to dinner with a friend and um, she was going to drive me home. I said, hey, I said, take a look at her. And um, 
I walked down to King's Road and I there was some some people actually the pub has just come out as well. <laughs> it was actually all a stupid idea. But actually several people said, Ah look, it's all the pet shop boys. Well, I mean they don't know. It's all right, and people often look quite pleased, don't they? People very rarely pass you. And also of course if you keep your you don't look people in the eye, they often won't even realise anyway. It's when often we look someone in the eye they go, mm-hmm. it's in. Um, you know, otherwise they, you can you can just carry on. No, I was thinking more on uh, in the days when you were on a smash kid stuff and um, pop stars must have been telling you how they were, you know, accosted and all these people, you know, intruding their private lives and so on. You know, I thought maybe you were making comparison with yourself that you really have can be successful and, you know, um, you like no, to no I wasn't, that really wasn't the intention. I mean, it was just, because I mean, most of the, the record is really is about real people mm. rather than fantastic sort of people. I mean, uh, it's, some of it's quite prosaic, I think. Um, you know, like the kitchen sink in my mm. and you pay my rent. Mm. The, the, I think it's deliberately, I mean, I like that sort of prosaicness. Um, and um, so that's it's more to do with that than any, it's no, there's no comment there on but if you're a pop star, you walk down the street. Mm. Uh, it's never a good uh, The next one is Heart, which has a very interesting uh, intro. Actually, it's interesting, so we had the intro as well. Um, we, we recorded the track with Andy Richards, and then um, Julian Mendelssohn, um, we got to remix it, and we put the tape on, and we were doing something with it, and he accidentally re- recorded over all the drums in the beginning. And he we, wiped the He wiped the... the and, um, <laughs> oh, oh, actually, fortunately, we realised that we were wiping so we're doing the shopping, track. We? Mm-hmm. And um, so he stopped it quickly, and then we went back and we, we thought, oh, we've wiped it, you know, but it was only the drums that were missing. So, so, like that is what, so that's why the introduction starts with no drums. <laughs> but it's really good that it doesn't know. Mm. <laughs> and the, the, the uh, 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 is a mixture, a heavy, oh. It's a dangerous area, this. Yeah. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's such good fun. But Very I mean, reminds us of Italy. <laughs> Oh, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's more suing you or something. I didn't, I didn't oh, come on, if there is anybody to be sued, what about the rap boys? I mean, the, the hip hop. They sample everything, are you kidding? The Beastie Boys actually oh, okay. just, yeah, just the whole put like said. two bars of someone's um, rhythm track and, and sing over it. Yeah, oh, exactly. they don't again. It's brilliant. Yeah. Though. I think it's quite good that people do that because I don't think people realise, although you do that, you're still. Do you have any no. You're still um, thinking of something new, really. I know. Well, also, um, a lot of that music wasn't um, getting heard by the general public or released because everyone was scared of over the copyright thing. Yeah. So there was a vast area of music, dance music, which was happening, which nobody was getting to hear, really, except for some deep, you know, if you went to the clubs, because of that reason, you know, mm. and it was... Heavy metal, new sort of yeah, like. Yeah, it was heavy metal then. We came out because you took you took it out of context. Well, the Beastie Boys, I know, there's no sleep till Brooklyn was in heavy metal shops. Yeah, uh, that's true. Run DMC, weren't they? Run DMC, weren't they? That's why it's in America. It was heavy metal record. Was people rapping there? They were back in Rio, weren't they? They were honest. Aerosmith, yeah. Actually, I like the link between rock music and dance music. Yeah. Because um, a lot of it, um, you know, those big drum sounds, they were kind of like lifted from rock albums mm. and then shoved into a, a dance track. So you, <laughs> you know, and a lot of the, the awesome noise rhythms are very rock. Yes, and they yet, are. They're very rock rhythms, and yet. The old were, were the first to do that. The yeah, they drum were. Sound. And they're very, and also it's, bl- it's black as well, it's, which is really good. You know, that. Hard uh, though is the most. Um, Pop's Polish song on the album, I think. Um, I mean, it could always be my but Madonna's song or something. Because it's very sort of, it's quite joyful, I think, and happy, and uh, unusually so for us, but it's a real uh, dance pop song. But I, I like this, I think it's just got a nice feeling so. I mean, the last one is uh, King's Cross. Yeah. That's probably. Oh, we got you happy, and then. Um... <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Finish off on that. Well, I think you, you end up where, where, where you started from, really, on the street. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And, uh, I mean, King's Cross is about, um, 
Well, you know, it's, it takes the, the image of down and out and people around the King's Cross Station. Sure. And it's really about people who get left out in our with England, or Britain, our side of the day. Yeah. It just starts them out at the back of the queue was sent to feel a slack of the government. There's just the idea that um, under Mrs. Thatcher's government, the people who feel the slack of the government really getting pushed about are the people who have the least in the first place. And that you know, Mrs. Thatcher was criticising the day before the election, and then people who were drivel and drool about caring, and, um, and that she said, encourage a society where people don't are encouraged not to care about anyone outside their immediate family circle. Um, I suppose Mrs. Thatcher would say the idea is everyone cared that looked after their own new and be looking after it. And then, of course, our life isn't like that. And, uh, and uh, so that was really what it's about. And then your King's Cross is a station in Bristol where um, you come down from the North East. And it's the most known part of England. And, uh, and a lot of Northerners, you know, you get Northerners hanging around there, you might get the train back, football supporters going back to Newcastle or Sutherland or somewhere. And, uh, and of course, you know, as you know, you get a lot of down that prostitution. And, uh, it's quite, a, it's also a very run down area as well, not King's Cross. It's quite depressing. It also has got worse over the last few years. You were saying this, weren't you? you know, oh, yeah, I was walking past King's Cross because I lived in Islington. So I was walking mm -hmm. into Central and it was going nice. It was walking. Nice. Yeah, it was a nice day. It was, a it was a nice, it was a really nice sun, sunny day. It was a Sunday afternoon. I walked past King's Cross and uh, there was somebody, you know, on crutches, just lying asleep in between the bus, in between the bus shelters. And, the, and then further back were lots of uh, alcoholics all drinking there. And this was on a Sunday afternoon, it's really depressing. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's just like, the place is littered with dirty, smelly bodies, you know. And it just, you know, it's not very nice really. Round it up from the room. That was a joke. <laughs> do, do you work for, for the pleasure or has it uh, got a purpose of uh, observing? From, I mean, from the creative point of view? Uh, both. Uh, I mean, the work for the musical pleasure, don't we? Mm. Um, mainly, that's the right, main pleasure, I think. And, um, the words are an extra sort of thing. I mean, they're but they are observations, mm. and uh, you know, it's obviously an important part of our records that we have dance records with those sort of word, words. You know, it's not just it doesn't just say check your body. Although that was the record anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's great when um, you get a good when some record they get a good phrase and the song doesn't really need anything more than that. It's like jack your body mm -hmm. or relax. You know, if you can get a good word, I think, you know, it's pretty good. Like um Melinda Kim had a No no um, like was showing out. You know. And it sort of just has a kind of meaning, you know, and you don't like Jack Your Body was a good one. In fact, that was all that was in that, wasn't it? Yeah. Jack Your Body. But you, you have uh, fans of uh, one of uh, our titles, aren't you? Yes. And it's only called Actually. I thought it would have been very, you know, apt and, um, you know, maybe sarcastic if you called it Thanks. Yes, I'm the first person to say that. Um, yeah, well, we've never had any attention of it, so I'll just call it something. Oh, thank you. But, um, yeah. It looks like thank you and good night. <laughs> it looks like that's the end. No, that's right. I didn't mean anything like that, you know. Just, you know. Thank you, it's not one of our words really, is it? No, it's pleases, but thanks is a very really special word. word. It actually is a word. It's a word. It's a very English word, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Like please was. People say actually a lot. Mm -hmm. And they do. Betty Byrne, who we co produced Street, uh, one of the tracks with Wink, and we just came from New York. And he commented that when we came into the studio in the morning, we put in the mix up. And we'd say, we both couldn't say independently, so it sounds quite good actually. And, uh, and he was annoyed that we, first we never said anything more than that, we never said sounds boring yet. We just said, sounds quite good. And, um, and also we would say, actually. <laughs> they said, oh, actually, actually, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he starts raving like, I never said, I never praising anything. And, uh, and uh, it which I thought was, do you know that's because you've got the album, actually? <laughs> and then we all laughed. And, uh, it just seemed to fit. 
And also, actually, it's quite, a, I mean, it is about actual people, actual places, natural things. It's more sort of real as I would say, sort of fist on that sort of And also, I think, actually, it's quite a sort of slightly pushy, confident word, you know. You know I'd like another drink, actually. And, uh, mm -hmm. You know, so it's quite, a, it's quite a pushy sort of word. And also, because it's, and yet it's, it's disguised as a polite word as well. Writing for this album, has it been different from when you were writing before? I remember stories when I went to before of uh, Chris coming down from Liverpool for weekends and then you were writing all the time. Was it different this time? Were you working uh, together again or independently? Or Well, some of the songs would have been written in the way that, you know, I don't know, I can't remember which ones. <laughs> Some of it's the same was written when it's it was written. It's the written in that period when I used to travel Long down. time, five years ago. But, um, yeah. this Rain time, was written in that period as well. Yeah. But this time, we actually went, booked into this, um, what's it like? It was like a, a stately home type place, mm -hmm. which felt it's like... A big house in the same It was a big house, I guess, stately home. <laughs> yeah, a big house which felt like it was in the country, although it was actually... Thirty minutes from Kingston. It was like... <laughs> 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 we somewhere. thought, we actually thought we were booking into somewhere like, <laughs> amazing in the country. It was actually Kingston. So <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's very good. Exit was the other side of the river. It's heaven on court. Anyway, because we thought, well, we're never going to, you know, we're never going to get to write something. We thought, well, we don't want to do it in some horrible demo studio. I thought we'd go somewhere nice. So we booked a couple of a couple of days. <laughs> now most people seem like going on, you know, going uh, away for months. You know, but anyway, we went there for we about about three couple days, of days, days you know, <laughs> and uh, we wrote a few songs there. It's and it's actually, it actually doesn't really take much time to write a song, really. You don't need months because you know if you if you set aside months to do it, you probably wouldn't do anything until the last few days. You think, God, we better write some songs. You know, we've been here three months now. Um, but when you, you know, so we, we had ideas. Like we went in there with the idea of writing a song called Shopping, mm -hmm. and um, you know we have we had bits of things to work on anyway, and uh, and so we just put down we thought of rough ideas. Then we went to a demo studio for for a couple of weeks and uh, three weeks and, and we made them properly. Yeah, and we demoed a couple of home songs as well.